Hello everyone, my name is Melanie Courtina and this was an example of what is called out of bounds in the video game. This terrain was made using Flowscape and the music was created by Yatoni. Thank you so much for allowing me to use it. I will now briefly introduce myself. I'm a Paris-based artist and designer and I work mostly with emerging or new technologies. I specifically enjoy using virtual and augmented reality creating immersive installations and video games. Through the use of these set mediums, I create speculative worlds and environments, and I want to explore interaction and gameplay mechanism. I want to ask and redefine what they imply, what they mean, and their consequences. Interdisciplinarity is also a notion that is very important uh, within my practice. That leads me to collaborate with people from various creative fields, such as music, fashion, cinema, architecture, but also furniture design and landscaping. I'm also about to start teaching video game theory at ECAL, École Cantonale d'Art de Lausanne, this year. I'm currently in the middle of getting my classes ready. Uh, in this context, I'll probably do a little history check, some kind of genesis of the medium, uh, starting by finding out what is considered to be the very first video game. And this is surprisingly quite a complicated subject to start with. Some would say that the very first video game is something called the cathode ray tube amusement device. It's created by physicist Thomas Goldsmith Jr. in 1947 and remained at a patent state. state. What was supposed to happen would be that the player would have a restricted amount of time to navigate with the dots thanks to a control knob and would fire at an airplane by pressing a button, but as this was never properly developed, we could argue that the first video game was maybe born a little bit later, let's say 1950, with a computer game called Bertie the Brain, which was enabled by a four meter tall Canadian machine, allowing people to play a game of tic-tac-toe with it. Or it could be 1958, Tennis for Two, as this was the first time someone was trying to go deeper uh, and further uh, in technological demonstration and created something with the sole purpose to entertain the Indians, uh, just for fun. And you know, maybe it's something uh, more simple, like the super famous game called Pong, 1972 for the Maniava Codice, which was the very first home video game console, which could be connected to a television. It was a table tennis game for two players, controlling paddles that would move vertically to hit a ball, a ball back and forth and gain points, but I'm probably sure you know of it. Uh, it actually was a total bestseller that launched what we call the first generation of uh, video games. And as you can see, even the very own definition of the first video game is pretty controversial. No one seems to agree. And it is a phenomenon, still true with nowadays games, as many people disagree on what it takes to be considered a video game. So, rather than trying to define what it is technically, you know, a video game could probably be defined as uh, something digital, working thanks to a computer program, on some sort of monitor, but beyond the technical aspect of the definition of the medium, what is the framework? Uh, where does this definition end? What are the specificities? In short, what are its borders? So, I want to tell you about a friend of mine. I happen to have a friend who once told me many, many years ago, back when Candy Crush was the ultimate mobile hit, so at least six or seven years ago. So he told me that Candy Crush was a fake video game. And it wasn't because of the fact that uh, Candy Crush is literally just something designed to trick you into spending money on in-game content, um, because this is a completely different subject, still fascinating though, but no. This friend was playing a lot, especially games on his PC, a lot of Starcraft, League of Legends, World of Warcraft when he was younger. He's what we would call a hardcore gamer, uh, in contrast with casual gamers. A hardcore gamer uh, would be someone that devotes a large portion of their time toward gaming, someone who's really passionate about the subject, maybe someone who owns high-end equipment and often plays for a competition. A casual gamer, on the other hand, is someone that plays game occasionally or in short sessions. 
Midcore gamers are the in-between. They might regularly play, but not in a super serious or super competitive mode. I would say that I'm a midcore gamer myself. But you see, Candy Crush was the perfect game for the casuals and for many reasons. You can play Candy Crush using your smartphone at any time from anywhere, so it can be in short sessions, for example in the subway or waiting in line. You can play without having to spend real life money, let me be more specific, without having to buy expensive equipment like a gaming PC or a console. People were not buying smartphones just to play Candy Crush. It just happened that they already owned the device and the game was free to play. Its gameplay mechanisms uh, in Candy Crush are, are so quite accessible, uh, simple even, in contrast to many other games that require the player to learn many combinations of buttons. Some of them even expect the player to already be familiar with some part of the gameplay. I think about um, Kojima's games a lot. Uh, its design, uh, with all the cute shapes and various colors, it created some kind of aesthetic, uh, very accessible, very approachable and pleasurable. I mean, anyone can play Candy Crush. And let me tell you that my friend's reaction wasn't just an isolated case. Uh, as an article from The Guardian titled at this time, Why is Candy Crush Saga so popular? King's puzzle game may not be to every hardcore gamer's taste, but their friends, family and co-workers love it. So, why would it be defined as a fake game in opposition with supposed real games? Why all the hate? Uh, why would this generate anger, scorn even? And from my perspective, this comes from an irrational feeling of jealousy. Maybe a little bit of fear as well. Uh, like these new non-conventional players with their casual games were about to replace my friend somehow or steal something that was so strongly a part of his identity. And jealousy. Because I have to remind you that this was like six, maybe seven years ago, and being labeled a gamer then was not as normalized as today. Even before that, uh, when my friend started playing as a younger child, it probably was even worse. It was still a bit shameful to openly share about your interest in this subject. You wouldn't want to be labeled a nerd or geek. So, observing so many people so far beyond the usual spectrum of said gamers, and I mean older people, uh, women even, your mom, your dad, your grandparents could play, I really think that seeing them being able to play openly, in public, and casually discuss this among them made my friend wish he could do the same with his less acceptable interest, because he probably experienced some kind of rejections. Uh, in regard to sharing about his own personal favorite games. And in an opposite way, I noticed that people that were frequently playing Candy Crush didn't felt the need at all of having some kind of competition with others, uh, to compare themselves to others, except like in a playful and relaxed way regarding the, their levels. I don't even think that they labeled themselves as uh, gamers at all. They just played. So, as you can see, the borders I'm talking about here are created by the player themselves. Borders between real games and fake games. Borders between hardcore and casual gamers. Now, Candy Crush went out in 2012, and I think that almost 10 years later, many things would have changed regarding our way of perceiving video games. I would go further and say that these definitions of casual, mid-core, hardcore gamers feels almost obsolete now, now that a younger generation grew up massively playing, playing games like Minecraft and Roblox and Fortnite. This younger generation normalized playing video games and even made the games they played fit to their new and other uses. Fortnite, which is a battle royale type of game, you have to kill people before they kill you, has now a mode called Party Royale, which consists of an island for just hanging out with friends. A social place. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong, way before Fortnite's existence, older players were using Second Life to throw fetish party or get married in World of Warcraft. But this says a lot about the new way people are now perceiving video games and what they're able to do inside it. The borders surrounding the possibilities inside these spaces are expanding. 
I mean, famous World War musicians are throwing concerts nowadays uh, inside Fortnite, like Travis Scott, Marshmello, Ariana Grande recently. Uh, another great example uh, was with the massive success of the game of Nintendo uh, in the Switch, called uh, Animal Crossing. Um, it was a massive success during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the beginning of it. I think it's because maybe people felt uh, reassured. Uh, playing something so calm and relaxing and peaceful uh, in terms of ambience and gameplay in these troubled times. But they also use their island as some kind of new digital and social spaces and go as far as, uh, you know, uh, during lockdowns people weren't allowed to travel, uh, even if that meant not being able to see the grave of a lost relative. So players built graveyards in their islands and invited other players for memorials, again, expanding the possibilities of the video game, treating it as a space for grief. There are still some disagreements uh, in regard to other more niche type of games in terms of definitions. A perfect example of what could be called not a real or a fake video game would be visual novels. Uh, which are digital experiences with a very story-driven gameplay that involves a lot of reading. We think that it was born maybe in 1983 with the Portopia serial murder case. It was a story about solving a case, uh, a crime, uh, resolving puzzles and talking with characters in order to understand what happened. Other popular example that can be qualified as visual novels would be Phoenix Wright, Ace Attorney and Professor Layton. There are no wait, There are two distinct approaches of the medium video games that I want to talk about. There is narratology and ludology. The narratology approach defines games as a medium of narrative and storytelling, like movies and novels. The ludology approach defines game as interactive systems first and foremost, and the storyline detail is far less important in regards to the gameplay itself. The feeling within visual novels is very similar to the choose-your-own-adventure type of books, uh, but there's a big difference here, which is the possibility of interaction. Uh, even if you don't shoot at enemies or race opponents, you interact with character, you explore new worlds and make decisions within the mediums. In terms of a ludology or a narratology approach, uh, it works. In my opinion, Dismissing this genre as a fake game or not a game at all comes from the same place as the Candy Crush hate I mentioned earlier. And also, often it comes from the same groups of people. Video games is still a young medium uh, with a definition and limitations constantly evolving. But borders in the field of video game can also have another meeting, a more concrete one. So, because of technological and narrative limitations, video games have to be surrounded and defined by some concrete borders. In a game when you can move around, there has to be ways to physically contain the player inside the play area. Even in said open words, uh, there is a limit uh, to where the player is able to travel. And there are many ways as this is done. And I'm not talking about obstacles that are part of the story and the quest and have to be uh, overstepped, um, like the bushes in Pokémon blocking the path. In order to go further, you have to teach Cut to one of your Pokémons and then you can move on. Or maybe the fire in Resident Evil that you have to put out. Um, these are just variation of the all, oh, there's a door in front of me and to go past it I have to find a key and then I find the key and then I use it on the door and unlock it and then I can progress to the next level. I'm focused here on what the player isn't supposed to cross at all. Sometimes these borders can feel very frustrative, like when invisible walls are used, making a character suddenly unable to move further a certain point in the level, like he hits something yet you, that you cannot see. And I call this frustrative because it's purely and simply breaking the fourth wall, the story between becoming immediately aware of itself. 
But crossing the borders can also teleport you directly back into the play area or it could simply be declared a mission abort and again you go back. Uh, every game designer has to find a solution regarding this topic. It can also be handled among the line of the narrative by making your character or companion uh, say it's not a good idea to go over there or oh I should rather focus on my quest like what Red Lion tells you in Zelda Wind Waker whenever you try to go too far in the ocean. You can also find unbeatable hostiles keeping these borders that are far too powerful for you and simply kill you when you cross it and then game over and back to the play area. Or the weather can change, the wind can push you back inside the play area or a sandstorm can block your view, for example by obstructing your view, your camera. It can be handled with humor, like in GTA, where a shark spawn when you go too far swimming in deep waters and literally eats you alive, game over. Or it can simply make sense that uh, your character cannot swim too far or swim at all because uh, he's wearing a heavy armor, for example. But I think that often, limiting the player inside a certain zone is managed purely by a good level design. The world you're exploring can simply have really high mountains that the character you're playing can possibly climb, or deep ravines and cliffs that he's not able to cross. This is very believable as do not go their borders. Uh, it can even be meaningful and give the player a more immersed feeling. For example, with a damaged or destroyed road in a story about a post-apocalyptic world, uh, or a really dense forest in a video game. Um, these concrete borders can also be treated as a part of the game, say, the gameplay itself. For example, during last summer I created a game named Ten Nuns. It works as some kind of walking simulator and it was made in order to go with the first ambient album of an artist called Biatoni, the same that did the music in the beginning for the intro of this video. So. The game was created around the music itself, and not the other way around. We could thereby consider it as some kind of interactive video, video clip, but to me it's also a video game. You play as a silent knight in metal armor and wander through ruins of an ancient civilization using a combination of keyboard and mouse or a gamepad. And in order to go from the first song to the second song from the album and so on, the character you're playing has to physically cross borders frontiers that are looking like lines on the floor made of light that are also surrounding the perimeter. This will allow him to travel to the next level and listen to the next song from the album. Because um, it appeared to me that nowadays our experience listening to music has evolved uh, significantly because of streaming services and because we often do not have the patience necessary to listen and wait anymore. If we want to listen to an album on Spotify uh, or a SoundCloud, for example, we might just play the first song and then, oh, the last one has a funny name, I'll play this one afterwards. But there is a specific order in which the musician conceived the album and arranged the tracks within. In Ten Lens, the game, you cannot jump from the first level to the last one. There is no menu or path allowing that. The story that you can understand from wandering inside the different words, even if there is no dialogue or text in the game, unfolds incrementally, and so does the album. Uh, in a way, this, this way of listening to music is very similar to listening to a vinyl, one song after the other. So, watching people play this game, I could notice that they understood right away what these light borders meant in terms of gameplay, but I also noticed something else, uh, especially when the player thinks that I'm not behind their back watching their deeds and actions. At some point in their explorations, some of them would have the impetuous desire to charge randomly into the walls or boulders, to try pushing around every corner of the level, in fact hoping to cross what is called colliders, it's an invisible element that keeps tracks of collisions and in this case make that the character you're playing doesn't go through physical elements like in real life. This, of course, isn't a behavior specific to tenants, no. 
can be found in pretty much every game. When you go to YouTube and type out of bounds video game, you'll find millions of you videos talking about the secrets they found going further than what was supposed to be possible. I have to admit that uh, it's something that I happen to do as well from time to time and since a long time. Uh, even before the existence of online video tutorials on how to perform the famous clipping move in Super Mario Odyssey, there was heresies or urban legends in the schoolyard about ways to go behind the maps in our favorite games. So, in order to experience an out of bounds in a game, players can get really creative. They can simply try, as, uh, as I was telling you earlier, pushing against obstacles in order to find a way to encounter a flaw or a hole behind colliders, between colliders, and then be able to pass through. But any possibility found within the gameplay can and will be used. For example, uh, you can try pushing buttons in times you're not really supposed to touch anything. For example, while examining an object in Left It's Strange, it allows you to clip right through the objects and go under the level. Or you can basically make yourself explode with a bomb or a mine uh, in order to take advantage of the impact that sometimes can make your character fly beyond the borders. Uh, or it, you can enable uh, with the game over a few seconds of free camera before the game over. In this game, uh, it's a camera that can fly in a game where you basically incarnate a character walking or running on the ground and allowing the players to take advantage of this short lapse of time, uh, allow them to go investigate further every corner of the game. In order to go beyond these borders, player will go as far as modding the game. Modding is short for modification, well, mods is short for modification, and in that case, we're talking about the mods, the, not the one created by the game developer themselves, but by the community or fans of the said game. It consists of alterating the program code uh, in order to change the game. Um, basically, it means that using these modes, players can now access a free camera that can fly around levels or deactivate these colliders I was telling you about uh, in order to be able to snoop around. And this is quite fascinating to me. I mean, in the end, why are players so eager to go out of bounds beyond the game's intended borders? What's driving them? I feel like there's something captivating about these places beyond your reach. It's a forbidden land, beyond the mountains and across the seas, and who knows what secrets or treasures could be hidden there. I mean, looking at these YouTube videos, performing or listing all the out of bounds they could find, I noticed the peculiar adjectives employed to qualify their findings. Words like crazy, strange, bizarre, or something that I find particularly of interest. Creepy. A well-responsive Reddit thread by user Tanatonauts titles Deep and can kind of fear went out of bounds in a game. Anyone ever experienced this? And yes, a lot of people actually experienced this. There is indeed a weird vibe about these places. The user talks about uh, one of the most powerful emotions he experienced during gaming from the time he would play Counter-Strike as a kid. He said that he would experience a profound little freak out uh, when he switched to free look um, and zoomed around the map. Uh, when he went past the playable areas, the world stops uh, rendering properly and it begins to have some kind of repetitions of the edge of the geometry and the texture, uh, sort of uh, moving around uh, a window in the screen of a crash computer, um, and also with a background of a black void that is the outside of the map. So this creepy feeling might have something to do with the immersion of a game being suddenly broke uh, in a non-aesthetically trippy way, the cognitive dissonance of it being suddenly aware of the falsehood. It might also have something to do with the design of the boundaries themselves. We talked a lot about oceans surrounding the playable areas and these deep waters are usually rendered as very dark, like in Skyrim or even PUBG, players' unknown battlegrounds. 
swimming underwater toward the boundaries feel quite uncomfortable. As you see, the DMC surface uh, fade into some kind of formless darkness while you're drowning. However, going out of bounds can also be an experience without visually a lot of violent glitching, like in the Outrunning show video I showed you earlier. It can feel very strange, but also very peaceful in these vast spaces that weren't meant to be observed, often empty and quiet. This eerie feeling, both scary and exciting, this ambivalence is so particular and so interesting to me. Today, uh, the game designers are quite aware of this type of behaviors in players. And sometimes they even go as far as hiding ha things on purpose for other players to find in, little easter eggs, like in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3, where if you kill yourself in the back of one of the multiplayer maps, you can go over a fence and spot a hatch with numbers, which is a direct reference to the show called Lost. Well, um, this concludes today's lecture. Uh, thank you so much to Beatrice Joyeux Prunel and Anthony Bekirov and Thibaut Vaillancourt from the University of Geneva for having me. Thanks to you for your attention and bye bye.